This section is on political history of Georgia. We're not going to cover every single aspect of Georgia history. We're going to hit three kind of uh, anomalies or high points that are unique to Georgia or that have bear some political significance. We're first going to start with what's known as the convict lease system in Georgia. With the advent of the 13th Amendment, and this is post-Civil War, the federal government enacted the 13th Amendment, which officially abolished slavery. What that meant for the state of Georgia, which was largely agrarian, was that farmers were seeking a solid source of labor, and they were having a hard time filling that labor need. So they looked to the state penitentiary, specifically with Milledgeville, and what occurred was the farmers and private industries would pay the state to lease the prisoners for labor. It was very lucrative for the state and assisted the farmers and private industry. This continued from 1867 until 1908 and ultimately was outlawed due to the very inhumane treatment of the convicts. The next thing we're going to talk about is the Reconstruction period for the state of Georgia. The Civil War was obviously very destabilizing for the entire nation and especially for the secessionist state of Georgia. In Augusta there were bread riots. In Wilkes County things got so bad that they had to institute martial law. And so we see this widespread instability throughout the state. Lincoln and Johnson's path for Reconstruction was very lenient, and Georgia began down the path. They had to accept an appointed provisional governor. They had to call a constitutional convention at which they would annul secession, denounce slavery, and repudiate state debt. The acceptance of the 13th Amendment, which again abolished slavery, and the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed equality and civil rights for all, including former slaves, also must be embraced by the state. The refusal of the 14th Amendment um, was wise, widespread in the South, except for the state of Tennessee. This led to the first Reconstruction Act, which implemented martial law in the state of Georgia. One of the roles of the military was to register former slaves and eligible white voters to attend or have a voice then at the Constitutional Convention, which would, at the convention, this new Constitution, would ensure suffrage and equality for former slaves. This Constitutional Convention adjourned in March of 1968, and then it went to the voters in April and was approved. These gains for former slaves were certainly short-lived with the election of Governor Rufus Bullock in 1868. He expelled all of the black legislators that were in the state. And, of course, to this, the federal government again responded with military rule and added the requirement of the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment allowed suffrage for... Um, any man regardless of skin color. So the state of Georgia ultimately ratified the 15th Amendment and was redeemed in 1872. Of course, the acceptance of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which ultimately were an attempt to make a citizen out of former freed slaves, were short-lived. With the implementation in the state of Jim Crow laws, there would be continued segregation and inequality. The final thing that's of interest in the state of Georgia that's kind of unique is in the state of Georgia at one point we had three governors. In 1946 to 1947, 
we had an interesting situation where at one point there were, at one time, three individuals that claimed to be governor of the state of Georgia. It all starts with Eugene Talmadge, who won the, Democrat, the Democratic primary in the state. And at this time, the state was so heavily for the Democrat Party that essentially elections were determined in the primary. Eugene Talmadge grew ill and his supporters were fearful that he may not make the general election, meaning his health was so bad. So they began to do some research and found a precedent that stated that if um, the existing governor, the governor-elect, was unable to take office, that the General Assembly could choose from the top three candidates in the general election. So, Eugene Talmadge's supporters began a write-in campaign for Eugene's son, Herman Talmadge, who they claimed then, they went ahead and the General Assembly selected Herman Talmadge as the rightful governor of Georgia. The second individual was Melvin Thompson, who was the newly elected lieutenant governor. And of course, Melvin Thompson argued that the role of the lieutenant governor was that the lieutenant governor would fill in if the governor could not fulfill his duties. So Melvin Thompson also argued that he was the rightful governor. The third individual was the outgoing governor, Ellis Arnold, who refused to leave office until the governor debacle was corrected. Ultimately, the Supreme Court determined that Melvin Thompson was the rightful um, individual to hold the office until an election could be held. And that's it for Georgia history. Of course, there's lots of other uh, nuances associated with Georgia history that can be found in the summary.